Well, welcome to the podcast. And today we've gone to California in the US. This gentleman is a, what you call a serial entrepreneur. And that's not something you eat. He knows how to build businesses. He knows how to create wealth and create success. He's done a few of them over the years. And we're going to get into that. He's got a great new product that we're also going to talk about. Welcome to the podcast, Darren Lanchester. How are you? Uh, thank you. I'm great. I'm great, Rob. And Man, thanks for that. That's an amazing intro. I hope I can back it up. Mate, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. Look, we say that success leaves hints. It leaves a trail. So I'm going to say, to you, where did your trail start? Where did you grow up? <laughs> well, I mean, I was born in Texas, but I spent maybe, uh, you know, a minute or two there. Yep. And then uh, my parents are both uh, musicians. We were on the road for the first four or five yep. years of my life. Um, probably a bit of the sort of creative, uh, aspects of what's in me is, you know, come through that, through that mm -hmm. path. But eventually they settled down in Lake Tahoe, mm -hmm. um, up in the mountains. And so I pretty much grew up on dirt bikes and on the slopes and skiing and racing and being outdoors and being active. So, you know, that was kind of the, 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 the life I grew up in. Now, I'm pretty sure I'm going to know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What were you like at school? <laughs> um, you know, so it was, a tr it, it was a transformation, like middle school to high school. I really, I was pretty, I, I was kind of like, I, you know, band in the shadows. Like I didn't really, really want to stand out that much. And, um, you know, I let, sort of uh, had my hobbies and my sports, but you know, other than that, I didn't really stand out. Then I got to college and sort of figured out, hmm, maybe I got some game here. So uh, college <laughs> started becoming a little bit different for me and and to the point where, you know, I have a computer engineering degree and I would be hanging around with you know, friends and they get to know me over the course of weeks or months. And then eventually it circles around like, what is your major anyway? And you know, I say, well, I'm studying computer engineering, like, that's really funny. No, no, tell me for sure. Like, what? <laughs> tell me for real what your major is. Most people, when I ask them what their major was just in college, they say social life. So it's right. I mean, that's, that's really the uh, main value I got out of it. <laughs> it was, it's a shame no. because of, as you know, COVID's around the world. I spoke to a mate of mine's son who started uni, got seven months into uni, and COVID hit. He never mm -hmm. saw his class again. Mm -hmm. He went back on graduation day. And I said to him, you probably missed the most important part of uni is learning how to socialise and interact with people from all over the world and all different uh, um, types of people. And he looked at me and went, yeah, you're probably right. So they've come out of uni now without the social skills. Yeah. And they're saying there's going to be two or three years of these kids coming through. You've been a serial entrepreneur. How hard and or how important do you think it was with those social skills when you were starting out in your early life as a, as a CEO and trying to you know, make a name for yourself? Yeah, it's, you know, knowing how to work with others, how to collaborate, mm. um, that we can't do it on our own. Mm. You know, it's, I've seen that in my own kids that, this struggle of how far they'll push themselves by themselves before they, you know, realize, Hey, it's okay to trust others. And like needing help isn't weakness. And, um, you know, so I, I, I can't say necessarily that I know that's an outcome, right. Mm -hmm. From, I mean, that they've probably picked up other skills and assets that we won't know for years that, Hmm. that are positives from this um certainly learning how to work with people <laughs> remote and uh yes true very true you, you know uh how to find happiness in quiet space because boy we all had a lot of quiet space for months but yeah i think that's got to be got to be an issue you know of, yeah. of and i like i said i see it i see it with my kids i have to sort of really reinforce with them that it's, um, you know, when you're at the bottom is yeah. the, is when you need the most help and That's suffering true. alone is just, I mean, why bother? Like, it's not what life's for. So, but that's a challenge. I think they don't, they're used to it. They're used yeah. to just, ah, I'm going to put my head down and just grind. And uh, 
no, why, why do it? When you, before you started to become a serial entrepreneur, and I was looking up, you looked, you started an, an eyewear direct company. You've done internet wireless. Did you go and work for someone else or did you just jump straight in and say, I'm going to make a name for myself? No, definitely not. There was, there was no notion of I'm making a name for myself um, coming out of school. It was right into, you know, computer engineering, yep. building, you know, uh, you know, part of defense uh, systems, airborne reconnaissance systems, yep. and pretty quickly into, um, you know, leadership roles, like a year out of college, I was leading a team. Mm -hmm. um, and my second job was um, with an ultrasound medical company building, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a state of the art ultrasound medical system. And, uh, you know, but through the course of, of those two experiences, you, know, you start to realize, like, I'm still not, I'm, I don't know what it is that I'm supposed to be doing, but this isn't quite it. Yep. And then um, from an uh, internship I did in college with uh, what used to be called Stanford Research Institute, SRI, mm -hmm. um, that network was responsible for every job I had for the first yeah. <laughs> like five or 10 years of my life. And um, one of my uh, real good friends, uh, Dave Beyer from SRI, had, had started a company and they were just starting to sort of see that maybe this thing can become a thing. And um, so about a year in, he said, hey, I heard you were looking, you, you're, you're interested to see what this is about. And all I can offer you is maybe nine or 12 months of, you know, a paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see after that. And uh, yeah, so that was my first experience, you know, kind of coming into the startup world as, you know, the third person in that in rooftop communications. And I had no idea that that was going to be my path. Like it, there was no notion of like, oh, this is it. Yeah, I finally yeah. found it. I mean, it just evolved. How, well, how nervous were you when you made the big call to uh, leave the safety of a, a well, you know, well-funded, well-run company to say, right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to give it a go? You know, pretty minimal. I, I was lucky because mm -hmm. um, Rooftop Communications had – uh, funding from government projects. And so there was enough, you, you, there wasn't this idea that you have to just go in and be all in on sweat equity. And mm. so I've actually had a lot more nerves being, you know, in my own businesses or different businesses since mm. then where, you know, yeah, you, you're, you're sacrificing, you know, cash uh, for, mm. you know, it's putting bets on the table. And so I was very fortunate that um, I had a gentle, uh, on ramp to being an entrepreneur, um, and 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 it just allowed me to 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 sort of grow within that environment and start to realize that hey, technology isn't really the you know I'm like a B level technologist at best, but so that's not really the like maximum use of of, of my skills, and um, you know I was lucky enough to have the space to kind of grow within that environment and eventually within Nokia who acquired our mm. business, you know, really sort of grew from there into the business development and marketing domains. And it's a very fortunate sort of space to um, experiment for me. What do you think you were looking for? I mean, what, what do you decide when you're someone like that, you've been in a business that's been bought by Nokia and you're going to go into your own businesses as well, and you're looking for a product or a service. How do you decide that this is the one I'm going to put my house on and this is the one we're going to back. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, there's so many dimensions to it and there's different, there's different ways that people think about it. I, mm. I definitely borrow from uh, one of my co-founders and the in inventor of thin optics, mm. uh, Teddy Shalone. He's, he's started more businesses than I'll ever start. And, you know, he has a few formulas like, um, can I own it, right? So, so in terms of the patent realm, is it a space that is defendable? Is it at least a billion dollar market cap space to move into? So if I do happen to succeed, odds being against it, but if I happen to succeed, it's a space that's big enough to yeah. really be meaningful. Um, and uh, I guess there's a lot that you you really experiment into in terms of, of, of understanding um, the, 
the role, right? The role of that product in people's lives. And that's something that's hard to know, you know, coming out. So you, you can't really validate that. That's more experimentation, I'd say, but but that you know you can produce it. You know the economics mm -hmm. seem reasonably okay that 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 some margin can be there that supports this being a viable business. But you know, there's only so far you can go. And then you just have to start taking steps by steps by steps that are experimental, they're incremental. And, and um, you know, each time you're taking those steps, being open to the idea that, hey, if you get negative data, good, better to get it now than later. And, and if this thing needs to be killed before you invest too much into it, good. Like that's a good thing. Before you uh, got involved with Ghost Sleeves and you look back at, some of the businesses you're involved with or the businesses you've owned, what's something you wish you knew then that you know now? <laughs> yeah, I think what I just said about the 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 incremental nature of of these yeah. businesses and even even when you have and you're at a point where you know you've got product market customer fit, you know, there's validation that um, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with like the traction and the entrepreneur's operating system, but they have this concept of a minimum viable product, an MVP. It's like, what's the bare minimum we could build and invest so that we could just get in the game and start yeah. learning. So you get in the game, you start learning and you get to a point where like, okay, the product market fit is, is, is there. And even at that point, you still don't know what the business is meant to do or be. Yeah. And it's shocking. I mean, it's most investors, most stakeholders expect us entrepreneurs to be, you know, five year uh, plans and omnipotence. And it's just not, it's not possible. And so, you know, it's, to me, it's like birthing a baby and just declaring on day one, this, 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 this kid's going to be a doctor, He's gonna grow up to be a doctor. <laughs> I just happen. know it. It's happening. It's going to be a doctor. Right. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, that's the anticipation or expectation that is put on businesses uh, by a lot of the, especially like institutional yeah. money that's put yeah. into these things. And so uh, I've had to live by those constraints and I've seen what it does and it, and it sometimes uh, constrains what businesses really can do because the expectation is it needs to be here. The reality is it's maybe not going to be on that trajectory. It's yeah. going to be something else. Um, and so we've had the luxury with ghost leaves of, you know, this is, this is our, uh, you know, pretty tightly held uh, little group here who gets to decide, you know, incrementally um, what this, what this business is meant to be when it grows up. And uh, I think that that's pretty pervasive. I mean, that cuts across so many different domains for me, but that would be like the most important thing. I think that's um, that I've learned and that we're applying now. So have you ever have you ever launched or been involved in a business that exactly what you thought you thought was going to be a doctor, we birthed it, it's going to go, and then a couple of months into it, it takes a right-hand turn and decides, well, it's going to go this way because that's where the market has pulled it. Have you ever had that happen to you? And, and how did you handle it? So you've got to change everything you thought was going to happen. Yeah. Well, so uh, my first startup, that was the experience. We, mm. you know, Rooftop Communications was... You know, this is when cable, uh, you know, high speed internet yeah. wasn't yet a thing. We're still doing dial up modems and starting that. to bridge. Yeah. Starting to bridge into copper and all of these things. And um, so here we are building this the next generation wireless mesh networking topology. Yeah. It's just a different, more robust way to build out a wireless network. And the idea, <laughs> so besides, supporting government, you know, contracts and, 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 and um, doing research in a way for the government under these DARPA and small business innovative research programs. The commercial side of it, believe it or not, was there's all these oil fields and they're all wired with telephone poles to get telemetry data from yeah. these oil rigs. We could just create a system that replaces all those really expensive, you know, hardwired lines that you know, we put a little wireless system in there and it's much cheaper. And so believe it or not, the first commercial system actually had this like modem interface 
So it could allow the system it was attaching to to think it's talking to a modem. So it could wow. feed the data back, it it. right? Yeah. And then, you know, I, I guess this seems like the most obvious thing ever, but it's like, wow, hmm, all these uh, mom and pop ISPs, internet service providers are trying to figure out how to like do deliver high-speed internet when they don't own copper. And hey. yeah, and it, it, it just was, it was, I, my recollection of it was sort of like, duh, in a way, like, of course, like that's the path we should be going. Um, but it was a complete right-hand turn. Um, you know, just a, 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 as big a pivot as you can make. Um, but it made a lot of sense and we had a lot of good sort of support and um, people with more experience than we had behind us to help back us up in that decision. And so we went with it. So these days, if anyone who's watching this on YouTube, but the ones who can't, behind you is a, it's a very nice thing about Go Sleeves, which is your current. What is Go Sleeves and what made you choose to go down that way? Yeah, well, I'll, 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 I'll go with the story on how we got there. My partner and the inventor, Roy Carrillo, and I, you know, we've, we've been playing basketball together for has to be roughly 15 years or more at this yeah. point. And um, so for uh, a good, you know, nine, 10 of those years, we just showed up once a week, we played ball, hammered each other and went home. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, over those years, you start to see more and more breakdowns and guys aren't showing up and injuries or, you know, I'm taping up or I'm, taking naperson so i can actually just play pain free i mean what whatever whatever the issue was and um that really you know for roy in particular was like you know his experience with trying to keep his body in the game really was 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 the sort of starting point for mm. it we actually did um we worked in thin optics together first um and so <laughs> eight or nine years into playing ball one day we started talking business and i said you know i'm i'm, I'm working i've helped co-found thin optics this thing is really taking off uh, like it's it's growing so exponentially that we can't stay on top of our customer support and and it's like well turns out i'm pretty good at that stuff and so um he joined us at thin optics and and we worked and learned together what each other is capable of, what we kept beating yeah. each other on the court. Yeah, true. And then uh, when it was time to uh, you know switch gears, I started a marketing agency, you know, help other brands with digital yeah. and social marketing. And um, but at the, but we started you know with this team that we had. I said you know we've got this engine right. We know how to do these things. Um, what are some products? What are some ideas? I mean, we just sort of started incubating ideas and it was really Roy's that, that really resonated first. And it was based on real need. It's that I've tried compression sleeves to take care of my body when it doesn't feel right. I've tried uh, kinesiology tape, you know, KT tape, rock tape, and those are very uh, useful products. And kinesiology is a great technology, but it's you know, you got to know how to tape yourself up and it's expensive and it doesn't stay on very well. And yes, you know, so the concept was, what if we brought these two things together? What if we built kinesiology technology or kinesiology tape into a reusable um, compression sleeve? And, and that is what Ghost Sleeves is. So we, uh, in his garage, this is another Silicon Valley garage startup story, started yep. uh, prototyping sleeves and he'd wear them and, and the other guys on the basketball court became the guinea pigs. And, uh, you know, let's just find out, especially with knee injuries, we started there and understanding um, how we can do a better job to support the muscles and ligaments and tendons around the knee. Um, but then once we learned more about how kinesiology works, we realized uh, it's, it's, it's actually a really powerful recovery tool. So like um, the calf sleeves that we have target the Achilles tendon, the calf muscle and the shin splints. And you may or may not need them when you're active or engaged in an activity. But if your body feels fatigued, achy at all, well, kinesiology is a mechanism to offset that and accelerate the recovery so that the next time you go back out, 
you're more fully uh, fully recovered from that fatigue. And that has performance benefits. It has injury prevention benefits. Um, you know, so the incremental learning is was along those lines of like, this will be a much better support mechanism. Then we realized it's way more than that. So today, people working longer, they're not retiring earlier. They're actually retiring much later or not retiring at all. COVID taught us one thing is that we needed to get off our couches, stop watching the footy, get out and walk around because, you know, it's better for the body. So something like this is better, especially as people get older, to be able to, and if, especially you know, I've spoken to people who were top grade athletes, they hit 40 and they've got the body of an 80 year old. Yeah. You know, their body is really, really giving them a hard time. If someone's looking at this and going, well, what is kinesiology versus a blue compression bag? I can go and get down at the chemist any time and it looks good and it gives you maybe a mental ability to think, you know, I'm looking after my knee. What is the biggest difference between what you guys are supplying versus the traditional blue or black compression bandage or compression sleeve that you see most of the uh, footballers and tennis players using? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I, generally, when you're just looking at a compression mm. sleeve, whether it's on a arm or a knee, mm. um, you know, it's just there. Primarily, it's going to be there for support, and mm. and you know, it's doing what you it's doing what the word says. It's compressing, you know, kind of keeping everything as supported as possible. Mm. A little bit of circulatory benefit. Um, but you know, that's about the extent of it. And one of the challenges with say a knee sleeve that is, you know, if your need is, I've had maybe histories of a uh, history of knee issues to your point, you know, I'm, I'm 40, but my knee is 65. Um, you might have some bone on bone type of osteoarthritis mm. issues. You might have, um, an MCL or an ACL previous injury. So it's, you know, uh, the, the knee has been compromised. So it needs extra support. And the challenge with sleeves that are trying to provide support is they, you know, to provide it adequately, it needs to be tight. Maybe that leads to a material that's not very breathable, like a neoprene. So all of a sudden you've got this True. thing strangling your knee. It smells bad. It doesn't move well. It slides around. Um, that's challenge, you know, that's, that's the challenge. And, um, you know, what we've done our, our, you know, this is for anybody who's on YouTube, but I'll try to describe it, but the sleeve looks like any other sleeve until you turn it inside out. Yeah. And when you turn it inside out and you look at the inside, you can see here's the, at the center of the sleeve is your kneecap. And then all around it are these kinesiology strips that are yeah. really trying to connect and support all the key muscles, ligaments, and tendons. And when you stretch this sleeve, you can see the strips the, the kinesiology strips are stretching and you lay that down on your skin and instead of compressing, it's actually doing the opposites. It's lifting and creating space in the skin tissues. All of a sudden, if you do have pain, it's taking pressure off the pain receptors. So there's a really good likelihood that if you have pain, it's going to be you know, minimized, if not you know, gone to zero when you have the sleeves on, it's possible. Um, any inflammation that you have by lifting uh, mm. the skin and creating space, we're flushing that area with extra blood. It's uh, sucking blood into that area. And that's helping the body's natural ability to recover from injury by mm. inflammation. If you're not injured, um, then it's actually that, that, that extra blood flow and improved lymphatic drainage is again, it's what the body does to recover from fatigue or to fight fatigue, whether you're in an activity or you're after. And so it's, it's, it's not just a supporting mechanism and a superior supporting mechanism. It's a completely different paradigm from what's out there now because it's doing the opposite of compression, really. We're not about compression. We just want a nice snug fit yeah. so that the kinesiology can do its work. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a profound change. And I want to go back to what you said before about people moving. Yeah. I mean, my parents were just like everybody else, uh, locked in their house for the most part for a couple of years. Yep. And boy, you know, between my dad's hips and it band and his knee and, you know, his body just started 
absolutely conspiring against him over the last three months. And what was the answer? Really, there's there was no medical need per se, other than getting in the pool with a physical therapist and moving. Yeah, That's it. True, true. I mean, you just needed to be moving, and our bodies are not meant to be stationary. And you know, so when Roy and I created these products, the initial idea was whatever you're capable of doing, whatever that movement is, whatever that peak is that you're capable of, like, let's get you there because movement is everything. There'll be a lot of people listening to this going, I've got a product. I've got an idea that I want to launch. How you've decided and you've gone what this product and you've proven it already. It's, it's going gangbusters that this is a winner. If you take the step back and someone's got another product and they're saying, well, is this is going to be a winner or is this going to be a dud? What can they do? Because there's no guarantees Yeah. with a product. What can someone do who's looking at launching a new product or a service? And you'll do, you've done it a few times. And you, anyone who looks up uh, the website, which I will put in the show notes, can see you guys have absolutely done it so well. What, are, what would you say to them to do? Yeah, it's, well, first of all, fear is the enemy of moving <laughs> forward. So, and again, you know, we'll go back to people needing help. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got the idea, um, just incrementally step forward and don't fear what you don't know. I mean, we, we, we're all not meant to go build a business by ourselves. That's, that's not the point. Mm. Like, we don't have the skills to do it. And we probably wouldn't enjoy that much. So, you know, it's all about who do you have in your network who might have some interest to help you untangle this thing and pull on the threads, you know, pull on yeah. one thread at a time, you know, and don't be afraid of, you know, there's what you do know, and I'm passionate about this. I feel like I'm dead on on this. Well, that's fine. What are the most important things that you feel like you're not so sure about and don't worry about pulling on those threads? Like a lot of times we want to avoid the tougher problems instead we of do. just taking them on. So I think getting some help, you know, getting some expertise around you that can help you pull on those threads incrementally, it starts to reduce the fear. Um, you know, you're not going it on your own. Yeah. So there's no particular formula of will this or won't this be mm. a winner. It's just a culture and a mindset of, incrementally pulling those threads and getting answers and slowly but surely you know that minefield of everything that could go wrong starts to get smaller and smaller um and and that's what you're aiming for i think the uh the most important aspect of that though in terms of pulling on threads is get it on like get that experience with users real users as soon as you can you know don't be afraid of Oh, I'm a, you know, the secret's going to be out. And I mean, the, the, your, your odds of getting killed by someone else doing it before you are much lower than your odds of getting killed because you launched something that's not right because you didn't work with customers or users yeah. to learn. You, you know, sometimes secret, it's not, can you? yeah, I mean, and sometimes it's not, will the product, oh, I know the product will work. Okay, great. But do you know what your users, like what, what mm. needs it'll solve and exactly how they'll talk about it? Like, do you know how you're going to convey to them what this is about? Well, not until you actually, you know, go with live ammo, if you will. So, um, you know, that's, that's again, this concept behind this minimum viable product, like get that, get the minimum built and get it out there and start to learn as quickly as you can. Now you've been involved with an email software company. You've been involved with digital and marketing and everywhere we're post COVID we're coming out how people buy is changing again where everyone went to online because a lot of the shops were shut and the data coming out now is people are swinging back to a, not as much but as a mix of online and uh, going into the bricks and mortar store there's all the magazines died but now they're coming back again if it's someone starting up You'd look at it, you've got a great product, you've done your research, you know it can sell. How do I advertise it? How do I get my bang for buck? Because a lot of companies starting out now don't have a huge, or they've got someone there who doesn't understand the digital marketing side. From someone who's done both and still does both, what would you say to someone? How, where should they start 
And how should they test the market to know where they should be spending their marketing or their advertising dollar? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to come at it from the perspective of, of you know, what my life has always been, cool. which is yeah. not having enough cash to go spray and pray. Yeah. Um, you know, so there are, we've all seen them. There's products on TV. They're, um, you know, they, they used to be at, called as seen on TV products. Yes. And, yeah. and, and that strategy comes from companies who rarely ever create the idea of the product. Mm. They just see something that might have a possibility of working. They make a deal with the entrepreneur to give them, you know, two cents of every dollar that they're going to make. But hey, when this thing is big, you know, you'd like to have a small slice of something big then a big slice of nothing, right? So the entrepreneur says, sure. And then they go spray and pray. I mean, they, they, but they have retail space. They throw it in retail stores and then they, have a massive budget that they can test for TV advertising and, and they have a recipe and it works. But most of us don't have that ammunition no. at our backs, right? So, you know, my perspective and just what I've honed over the years is you know, your best way to kind of have combat that with very uh, cost-effective learning mechanisms is, is a mix of online and offline. And so, Go sleeves right now is generally not available in retail, and that's by design. I mean, we yeah. know where we need to get to to set the stage for retail to be successful, and we don't have any interest in going there too soon because I've seen what that looks like. Um, and so you build the um, you, you build the store online, right? And online these days isn't just your website. It's also all of these other third party places, um, you know, walmart.com mm. and amazon and jet.com. I mean, the, you know, you got to make it easy for people to go find and research you. But to your point, like, we're all, we, we're still social beings mm. and anything new. So, so why are we not in retail? Because ghost sleeves aren't very cheap to manufacture. And so they're a premium price to what you would see in a Dick Sporting Goods. And so if you walk into Dick Sporting Goods and you see this product and you see, you know, something, you know, half that price, you're going to be looking pretty hard at that lower mm. cost product, unless you know something specific about why this product is superior, right? And so... You know, it's challenging to win in that environment, but if you walk into a store and someone and you ask someone a question, and let's say it's a specialty running store, and oh, you know, I've got this problem with shin splints, and man, they really, you know, or my Achilles gets so tight. Is there something I can do? And someone actually knowledgeable, you know, more of an assisted sale scenario says, "Yeah, actually, I've seen this." product on other athletes like there's olympians that are training and recovering in this uh product yeah. you know and they can tell that story yeah. well all of a sudden now you can compete and so um you, you what i found and what our mix is is we get out there in person at events like a year ago we started doing running events um trail running events getting connected to the sort of top competitors in a really, really difficult sport, trail running with massive elevations and so on, and and learning, like learning from them, and that they knew we were just there, you know, educating them and then seeing what they did with the product. It really sort of lowers their uh, deflector shields, if you will. They're they're and and when they have a good experience and and they're able to tell you what what's happening and what they're learning, they instantly feel like they're part of it. And so you're able to blend what you're doing online where you don't necessarily know or connect with people to building this community and building this tribe offline by being at events and connecting with people and building a network of, of, of influencers who, you know, influence runners or influence yeah. CrossFit athletes, whatever the sport is. And yeah, we've found that mix is a great way to, you know, build the brand in a very um, cost-effective way so that then it sort of is worthy of investing in going into retail. I suppose you're looking at sustainability rather than 
a huge amount of sales and then nothing. I mean, sometimes a slow burn is going to give you a lot bigger, better return on your investment, which is, I mean, let's be honest, that's what we're here for. We're here to make money, be success and uh, live comfortably when we say decide to. So there's no use just going out there with a big bang and then it's all over, Red Rover. Uh, that's, I mean, I've seen it. <laughs> yes, we've all seen it. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's not fun. I mean, and it's the reason that, um, I mean, we're fortunate enough to have figured out how to network to a group of investors who trust us and trust the pace and trust them. Like we always have a strategy. We always have metrics for what we're trying to achieve in a certain time frame. And they believe that if we follow that strategy and achieve those metrics, that we'll be successful. And I can say that probably the metrics that we talk about are would be underwhelming perhaps to a lot of institutional yeah. investors. And fair enough. Like, I mean, they got to be swinging for the fences. They don't have a whole lot of patience. I mean, they're 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 they just need a one in ten, even a one in twenty. If the other 19, if we push it too hard and they burn out, so be it, you know, yeah. no big deal. But, you know, if it's your baby, uh, you want to like gestate and mature it yeah. at its pace and learn. And um, to your point, like the growth and the sales uh, for us, especially launching right before COVID. I mean, imagine we yeah. launched January 2020. So <laughs> I'd like to see some do it, stats you know? on businesses it's, launched in yeah. the first quarter of 2020 and how many are still around, right? So, I mean, you know, had we had investors breathing down our necks to succeed in 2020 with sales growth, we'd be done. Yeah, it, it's funny, but uh, some of the most unusual companies absolutely took it and ran with it and have, have been so successful. And some of the ones you thought you wouldn't, you know. Before we wind up, a couple of good questions. What would you say to a young entrepreneur that pulled you up in the street and said, mate, what's the best piece of advice you can give me? Hmm. You know, again, I'm going to come from it, from my background of, of no matter who you are hmm. and what your skill set is, learn how to connect with people, like learn marketing, just at, just at least enough to, so that you know how to plug in people who really, really know marketing and not to sort of tie one hand behind their back and have them, you know, go out and battle. And like, uh, uh, this is, this is the Bible. That's always one, one, uh, arm linked away from me, but, th but this, this, uh, love marks, um, yeah. book that, you know, really like Kevin Roberts, you know, the Saatchi and Saatchi, yeah. um, uh, in, you know, stalwart this book i mean it's not new but and actually here for, for for those of us who maybe don't have marketing as their number one uh idea of where they want to spend time on it's a lot of pictures in this book <laughs> so it's actually fun to read even if you're not into marketing so call it a picture book Read that well, if you're a visual right? person, like, you know, it's not yeah. everyone is into uh, spreadsheets and, uh, <laughs> you know, PowerPoints. So if a visual person, it'll work for you. Exactly. But I think that there's just some fundamentals in that book about we think we think we're in charge of what we build and we we're we control and we build the brand. And no, the brand is this thing that has its own life and it lives in the like hearts and minds of your yeah. customers period end of story and all you're doing is trying to condition positive reactions positive emotions in your customers that's the best you can do you don't get to control your brand and so that's tough for somebody who might be a technical background mm. or um like we you know we're used to controlling things we're used to building things that hey if it fails it's my fault and um, it's, just, it's, it's a much softer world out there in the world of like building a brand and building marketing. And so that, I mean, there's a million things I could say, but that's one that I think is overlooked and, and not too many entrepreneurs say, oh, well, you should really know something about how to build relationships with customers and brand building. You should really know something about that. I think Tony Robbins said, the, uh, the big fella himself said, it doesn't have to be the best product, but if it's the best marketed, people will buy it. Yeah. 
where does Darren Lancaster like to go for a business meeting? When he gets a phone call and you've got to have an in-person one. Where in California, <laughs> where, do you, where do you like to hang out if you've got to have to sit there and talk business? You put me on the ski slopes with somebody, I'll talk to them there all day. If they can, they can <laughs> ski and relax on the chair and um, that, that would be by far number one. I guess it'd be really hard to have a conversation under the water scuba diving, but that, that's, that's <laughs> certainly, <laughs> you know, in between, let's say. Um, I guess uh, in, uh, in, in, in the real world, um, you know, anything, act, you know, we've got, we're fortunate enough to have great hiking five minutes yeah. away. I just find that you get outside and you start talking to people and, you know, it's the fastest way to sort of uh, put everybody's um, deflector shields down and, and, yeah. and to get a real feel for what they're about. If someone found the most ultimate 10 kilometer hike, and they could say, okay, Darren, you're going to have two people hike with you and you can pick their brains for the next hour. Who are you going to take along for the hike? you got to remember oh now, they've got to be able to do the hike. <laughs> well, 10 kilometres is... Yeah, because I'm talking 10 kilometres up not. and down. I'm not talking this flat right. track, you know, we, we're all the, the... We call them the special people in Australia, love to go and just look good and not do a lot. Something, you know, nice and challenging. Mm. Wow, boy, that's really something. So I, I wish I had uh, one of our uh, athletes, Zach Friedley. Zachary yeah. Friedley is an adaptive athlete that runs on a blade, right? He's born yeah. without a leg from the knee down. And, and what he can accomplish, what he's accomplishing yeah. um, is, is just beyond. Um, and so I would probably turn to him and say, who's in your world, you know, in your mind, yeah. who has had just, you know, the most beyond comprehension journey to get yeah. from just this lack of capability, if you want to call it that, right. And, yeah. and has experienced the bottom and has, and is now here is, is, is just, you know, killing it and accomplishing things that, that, anyone would be uh jealous of yeah I, 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 like recently at an event there was a woman who had lost over 100 pounds and and had this just amazingly emotional story about um that that process and was out doing an endurance run and she ran 30 miles that day um after having lost 100 pounds and saying i've been here volunteering but you know mm -hmm. there's I, I could barely walk successfully let alone run i mean the the stories of what people overcome in those circumstances, like that, those are the stories that need to be told because there's so many people out there who need to, you know, who, who can maybe find the right uh, motivation to, to just take one step, get moving. Um, so I, I'm always about uh, learning, learning, yeah. like, how do we tell those stories? How do we motivate people to get, to get moving? Awesome. So that would be one. Um, I don't know why, like I can, this guy is such a, such a uh, lightning rod, but Elon yeah, Musk cool. is such a sort of like, um, he's such a uh, like outlier, such a complete total outlier. Like if Jobs was still around, I'd love to yeah. like just try to dig in and understand what it is you it know where's this all coming from yeah and it doesn't mean you want to be them that's not nah. the point it's like how how like what, what you just to get some insights into you know how they do it how they think um most people can't accomplish what what they're capable of um but there's a lot more that we can accomplish than we realize and it's and sometimes it's just by someone you know turning the lights on in the room and saying look haven't you seen this before and you go oh well i kind of knew it was here but now that you mention it mm, that's <laughs> and right. um yeah so i guess i'm hypothesizing here that uh elon would maybe throw some lights on for me <laughs> it would be helpful <laughs> mate how where do people find darren lancaster and where do they find your product well, as you said, uh, ghost leaves, ghost leaves com. That's yeah. that's that's where you where you find us. And um, you know, if you're uh, if for some reason you you know you're looking specifically for me, I'm, I'm all all the standard Instagram, yeah. Facebook, you know, places, LinkedIn, all of that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I would first, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're on a mission to keep people moving and at the top of their game. So, um, pretty sure that applies to everybody. I would really prefer that you go check us out and see if it works for you. Uh, and then, and it helps you out. Mate, that's awesome. It's been fantastic talking to you today from one side of the world to the other. I love what you're doing. I love you, but Hey, you back yourself to me. That, that to me is everything. Uh, Absolutely fantastic. You take care. And as we say at the end of every one of our podcasts, have a groovy day.